Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of borders, language, culture, and here he is, winner of the National Radio Hall of Fame Award, Michael Savage. Thou shalt have no other god before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor thy father and thy mother. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. Those are the Ten Commandments, as you well know, written by a God who is seen as racist, sexist, and homophobic by the same leftists who are tearing down monuments to the Southern uh, General Lee across America. And it's only a matter of time until these vermin on the left, these communist scum, are going to start tearing down the Ten Commandments across America. And I'm asking you how much you're going to take of this. Where is the firewall of our police? The Charlottesville police should be investigating by the federal government, but I don't want to go into this, the scandal of what happened in the South. I want to talk about what's happening to this country. I want to talk about the deranged Nazi car terrorist and the fascist left. I want to talk about how anti-white rhetoric is fueling white nationalism. We have an expert on that uh, coming up. And I note, by the way, uh, that the late night hosts who are all, in my opinion, let's not say drug addicts because I don't know what they take. Maybe they just take aspirin for all I know. But to me, they're nothing but drug addicts and script readers. And I don't know how anybody can listen to a, an actor or a comedian on politics when they're, just, they're nothing but script readers. Do you understand that? Jimmy Fallon, Seth Meyers, Jimmy Kimmel, Sibyl Gabay, Conan O'Brien, who are these people? They're nothing but stand-up comedians who got lucky, got a good agent, got good management, wound up with a really great agency, and now we're supposed to take their political viewpoint seriously? Who were they when they started? Nobody! College dropout idiots! So now they've switched from comedy to attacking America, attacking Trump on a daily basis, and the junkie audiences laugh. How can you take anyone who reads scripts seriously? All they do is read scripts written by more intelligent people. But they're not the point of today's show. The point of today's show is whatever you want to make of it. Are we now all fascists for wanting to make America great again? Should every Civil War monument be taken down? Should all the Ten Commandments monuments be removed from America because they offend every liberal in America? Look at the Ten Commandments. Every one of the Ten Commandments, every one of them, is an affront to the Bernie followers. Thou shall have no other God before me. Are you telling me the narcissists on the left believe that there's a God? Are you telling me that the Katzenberg, Hatzenberg, Matzenberg, and Ratzenberg brigades believe there is a God? Listen to number two, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Tell that to Hollywood. How about remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy? When was the last time you kept it holy? How about honor thy father and thy mother? Every other movie, every other comedy show is about ripping apart family. Number six, thou shalt not kill. It's actually not the Hebrew word. The Hebrew word is not kill. It's murder. For those of you who think that it means thou shalt not kill, it means thou shalt not murder. I'll explain it to you another time. Here's number seven of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not commit adultery. That doesn't fly very well in New York and L.A., does it? Thou shalt not steal. How does that work for a welfare system that steals my income? Thou shalt not bear false witness. The entire left wing is built on false witness. As far as thou shalt not covet, I would say that applies to all Americans. We all covet everything at all times. We're all jealous of the next person. That's the American way. That's the opening to the show. Now, last night after the show, I felt I did one of my better shows in over 22 years of radio. I would rank it as my top five. It was the toughest show I've ever done in recent memory, or I'd done in recent memory. And I was spent. As any good performer knows, you can judge a good performance by how you feel afterwards. I felt good afterwards. I felt empty 
and I felt as though I had done a great show, and many people believe that. I had to walk that line, and I think I did it properly. I hope you agree with me. And then the evening came, and I sat in front of a large screen and watched an Apple TV app that was put up on a large screen in a property. It was like being in a movie theater. And of all the things I chose to watch, I watched Ken Burns' documentary on the Civil War. I thought this would be the most appropriate way for me to spend two hours. And two hours I did spend indeed. And I highly recommend you find it again. It's the great Civil War series uh, uh, produced by Ken Burns, the documentarian at that time by PBS. And I learned things about our Civil War that I really didn't know. One of the most pertinent things I learned, which I already knew because I told you about it on the show yesterday, is something that the vermin of the left really ought to learn before they tear down another Robert E. Lee statue. I want you to listen to this fact of life before you vermin on the left get out your crowbars again. Listen. On April 18th, four days after Sumter, Lee was summoned to Blair House at Lincoln's behest and offered field command of the entire Union Army. Lee said he would think about it. Virginia had voted to secede the day before. That night, he paced anxiously in the gardens around his Arlington mansion across the Potomac. At midnight, Saturday the 20th, Lee wrote his letter of resignation from the United States Army. On the 21st, the governor of Virginia asked Lee to take command of the state militia. When Lee had to choose between the nation and Virginia, there was never any, cho any doubt about what his choice would be. He went with his state, and he said, I can't draw my sword against my native state, or, or as he often said, my country. What a beautiful, beautiful piece of work this is. The narrator is David McCulloch, the historian that you heard afterwards, Shelby Foote. And these are facts and stories about Robert E. Lee that has been lost to the fascist left's history. I don't think they care about history. You have to understand something about communism. When communists take over a country, they blow up the history of the nation. Do you remember what happened in any of your history classes? Did you remember what happened after the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia? I don't think you even know what a Bolshevik is today. Bernie Sanders would be a Bolshevik. Hillary Clinton would be a Bolshevik. These are all Bolsheviks disguised as fair-minded human rights activists of the liberal left. No, but they're Bolsheviks. And the fact is, is that after the Bolsheviks took over Russia, the first thing they attacked was the church. They blew up icons of the church. They destroyed crosses. They blew up churches. They killed priests. Did you know that? How far are we away from this when you have the fascist left attacking anyone they don't agree with and the police doing nothing in Berkeley, again in Charlottesville? This is the new civil war in the United States of America. And make no mistake about it, it's going to get a lot worse before it gets any better. This is the savage nation. We'll also talk about how anti-white rhetoric is fueling white nationalism by David Marcus from The Federalist. We are also going to talk about a little health today on The Savage Nation, one of the topics I like to discuss. I read that a woman, weightlifter, died from taking protein uh, powder, high protein intake. Uh, I wasn't surprised to learn that. Of course, she turned out to have a biochemical defect. I should say a biomedical genetic defect. But uh, the story triggered something in me, which is the obsession with protein in America today and how most people don't understand that high-protein diets are extremely dangerous, even if you're healthy, because your kidneys have to take proteins apart. One of the major functions of the kidney is the elimination of the products of protein metabolism. I learned that on the road to my Ph.D. at the University of California, that the nitrogen core of protein molecules has to be deaminated in the kidneys. And so if you're on a high-protein diet, be very, very careful. We'll talk about that because there's protein toxicity. I also want to warn you about taking too much ibuprofen. Every time I turn a TV on, all I see are ads for pain painkillers. Day and night, painkillers. Day and night, they want a worker to take a pill every time he feels a quirk. If your grandfather did that, you wouldn't be alive today because kidney disease can be caused by abuse of analgesics like ibuprofen. Did you know that? How often have you seen a warning label about those dangers? The answer is never, but there should be some. This is the Savage Nation. The phone number is 855 400
I think the topics are fairly laid out. If you're not interested in any of them, then I suggest you turn on a late night host and get out a joint and smoke a doobie. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. The Savage Nation is sponsored by Swiss America, the only company I trust with my financial future. Call 800-289-2646 or SwissAmerica.com. Hurrah, hurrah. Everyone sing along. All the bouncing cannonball. These are all Civil War songs. We're reliving the Civil War in America today because the radical left realizes the best way to antagonize the poor white man is by calling him a racist, calling him a Nazi, going from calling those of us who voted for Trump now we've gone from deplorables to Nazi. We're all KKK members to them. This is really wonderful. Thank you, Bernie Sanders, you gutter rat, you. Thank you, Hillary Clinton, you loser, you. Thank you, Anderson Cooper, you faker, you. Thank you, Wolf, Wolf Blitzer, you. I can't take it anymore. The whole media is consigned to the ash heap of lies. So what do you want me to do, talk about health today? You want me to shift all of a sudden the health topics? Mike? I'm so glad you're talking about ibuprofen. Can I ask a question, maybe? What's the danger of Viagra? I'm a 72-year-old healthy man. I have a wonderful sex life with my wife of 69 years. She's three years old when I met her. I was the babysitter. I waited till she was at legal age. We have a wonderful life together, but I'm avoid too much of the Viagra. Maybe no good for me. You want me to do slapstick? I don't want to do it. I'm not in the mood. So what do you want me to do? The Civil War, we can talk about the Civil War from an intelligent point of view. Or we can talk about the conspiracy theories that are afoot in the media about the fact that it looks like Governor McAuliffe of Virginia, along with the local police, along with the ACLU, along with the fascists of the left, were in an orchestrated desire to make this entire thing blow up into a riot. But you don't want to talk about a conspiracy theory because that would make you think that you're listening to a show that has no relevance. But the show has great relevance. It is re re relevance. It survived relevance. <laughs> it survived 22 years now. In March, it'll be 23 years, God willing. And there is a reason for it. The reason is because the best defense against hatred is the truth. Did you know that? And the best defense against defamation is the truth. The best defense against scandalous remarks about you is the truth. Did you know that? And so since I try my best to tell you the truth the best I can and the best I know how, and because I have someone up there who likes me, somebody up there likes me, a great, great book by Rocky Graziano, the great middleweight boxer of my time. Well, he was in my father's time. I was lucky enough to have met him once. What a great guy this guy was. What a novel he wrote. Actually, there's an autobiography probably, oh, no one ever heard of it, called Somebody Up There Likes Me. What a great story that was. It touched me as a little kid. And I went to my friend's wedding. I'm getting distracted right now, but that's what I do because I like to do it, and I think you like me to do it. My friend's dead now. I don't want to talk about it, but he married Rocky Graziano's daughter. I hope she's a listener. Nice woman. I only met her that one or once or twice. And they were in the... Now, of course, Rocky Graziano was an Italian Catholic. I don't have to tell you that. That's like saying the Pope is Catholic. But Rocky was Catholic. My friend was Jewish. And I was in a rabbi's chamber. It was just the rabbi, the middleweight champ, Rocky Graziano, my friend and Rocky's daughter. And I'll never forget what I learned during that little interchange when the rabbi was rehearsing them for the wedding. I remember what Rocky said. He put his hand on the Bible and he said, this is the rock of ages. This has survived. And he was called Rocky Graziano for a reason. And he said, this book is the rock of ages. I never forget. I mean, I heard the phrase before, but it had no meaning to me. But when a man of that strength, that power, that courage said it, it made me understand how powerful the Bible really is. And so when I read for you the opening of the show today, the Ten Commandments, you look at the Ten Commandments, and I put them up on my Twitter feed just to insult you, those of you who hate everything about those of us who have succeeded, those of you who are jealous at home, who are losers, who have nothing to do but put hate on Twitter feeds and Facebook feeds, those of you who have no careers, 
those of you who have no professions, those of you without lives. I put up the Ten Commandments for a reason, because almost every one of the Ten Commandments is an affront to the communist left. Think about it. That's why they hate Jews. I figured this out a long time ago, why the Jews are hated around the world. People have misinterpreted this. It's because the, the Jews brought God to the average man, and the average man didn't want these commandments. You think the average man wanted red lights in his life? See, he's always blamed the Jew. The, the Jew said, thou shalt not have no other God. Thou shalt not make graven image. Thou shalt not take a Lord in the game. Remember the Sabbath, keep it holy. Honor thy father and thy mother. Thou shalt not kill, not commit adultery, not steal, not bear false witness, not covet. Who's the Jew to tell me that? How dare you, Jew, tell me that I shall not do anything? So the world has always hated the Jew for bringing them the Ten Commandments because they didn't want anyone to tell them what to do. So those are some of the topics. I uh, have to tell you, tonight is another night for the Civil War series, maybe. As the show finishes and whatever I do, I do. And night comes over the area, and I go to that big screen in that unknown living room, and I press the app, and the choices come down. I could watch horror. By the way, I never watch horror shows. I never watch supernatural shows. I try not to watch any shows with violence in them. I either watch uh, war, I watch war documentaries because the violence is not egregious, it's real. I will watch history shows. I like car shows. But I have a gripe about car shows. They're starting to nauseate me. Every car show is about Jay Leno. What is it? His agent now inveigled his way into... Every car show can't be about Jay Leno. If I go on the internet, I look on a car... I want to look at how to fix a carburetor on a Jaguar XKE. There's Jay Leno's piece. I'm sick of it. Why is everything about a car got to do with Jay Leno? And then there's a show that fixes up cars of celebrities. Why is every celebrity a left-wing gutter rat? Can anyone explain that to me? I have cars. I'm a collector of cars. Uh, what am I? Conservatives' cars don't count? I'm a deplorable, so they won't do a car show? Do you happen to know who owns the car show channel? I know. Who, who do you think owns Velocity? Do you know that there's an interlocking corporate directorship between almost every show on television and everything you think and everything you like? Even car shows have been taken over by the bigots of the left. Did you know that? All right, so we're talking about everything from proteins to liberals to racism, civil war, PBS, you name it, I got it, whatever. Be here or be nowhere. It's the Savage Nation. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. So I'm playing a little bit of music for you from the Civil War era. Uh, I don't know if you know that the Yankee Doodle Dandy was another Civil War tune. Someone put this up. Americans who were never slaves are fighting Americans who were never Nazis over a Confederate statue, a Confederate statue erected by Democrats because Democrats can't stand their own history anymore and somehow it's Trump's fault. Thank you. So now they want to tear down every every um, Ten Commandments monument. You say, no, that's not going to happen. It's already happening. The vermin in the ACLU, the Anti-Christian Liberty Union, every one of them hardcore communists, every one of them anti-American, pretending that they're Americans who protect the First Amendment. I wrote in my last book, Trump's War, the book before it, Government Zero, the book before that, Scorched Earth, the bestseller before that, Stop the Coming Civil War, I've had five best-selling books in a row, if not more. I can't even count them anymore. Every one of them winds up in the top of the New York Times list. Even a book about my dog, Teddy and me. Actually, that one didn't make the list. No, it did not. But my political books all become bestsellers. There's a big audience for reality. And the fact of the matter is, in each of these best-selling books, I stated that the head of the snake in this country, the head of all the problems in this country, is the ACLU. It is an un unelected group of degenerate lawyers, every one of whom is an enemy of freedom, and that if I had the power, if I were an advisor to the president, and I had the power, and if I were an advisor to Jeff Sessions, I would break the ACLU open like a can of worms using uh, re the RICO statutes. 
That's what I would do. The ACLU is the greatest danger to our freedom. They have fomented hatred in this nation from the day they were formed. But more to the point, the ACLU has sued over the last 30 years to take down every Ten Commandments uh, monument on any public property in this nation. They have sued to break the crosses off war memorials, men a thousand times better than the best one amongst them, their honor and their memory erased by the vermin, the drug-addicted vermin in the ACLU. It makes me so sad that no government official will stand up to these rats. But let's move on. Let's move on to an important word today, which is compromise. So I watched the Civil War series, and I wasn't amazed to find out it started over a little thing. It didn't start over a big thing. Many of you were duped into believing that Lincoln was uh, started the Civil War to free the slaves. That is a big lie. That is absolutely the biggest lie of, of, the, of, of our times. Yes, he was anti-slavery, as would any fair-minded human being be. Slavery, I will repeat, is perhaps the worst thing that could be done to another human. Rape, slavery, are sisters of the degradation of the human soul. So let's get that out of the way. But Lincoln, although he was anti-slavery, did not start the Civil War over the issue of slavery. Lincoln began the Civil War to prevent the secession of the southern states from the Union. He said he will do everything in his power in order to prevent the secession of the southern states. It was only later on during the Civil War that it became an issue of slavery, or the issue of slavery became the prominent or dominant issue of the Civil War. Do you understand that? Anyway, I don't know. Again, you know, sometimes I say something on this show. I'm I'm a former teacher, a former professor. It's very hard to have this dialogue with an unknown audience in radio. I'm in a studio staring at a wall. There's no one here. I have a dog sleeping at my feet. My best friend, 13 years old, he's getting sick and old. It's very sad to watch him get sick and old, and it's getting me very depressed. I've had it happen before, but I don't want to go down that road right now. I'll go down that road another time. But this morning, he started to quiver for no reason. He was shaking like a leaf. He was quivering. I've never seen this happen. There was no loud sound. There was nothing happened. The dog was just shaking like a leaf. This little, this little dog of mine, this little 10, 12-pound guy I've had for 13 years, he's normally a spunky guy, jumps in the bay, full of life, full of love, and he starts to quiver. I didn't know what was wrong with him. I tried everything. He wouldn't even eat what he likes, the greeny nothing. Well, he's sitting under my feet right now. I put his coat on him before. He seems to be good. He loves the radio show. He loves to sit and hear my voice. He loves to feel the energy in my voice. I guess maybe he feels better now that I feel better. I don't really know what it is. I think everyone in this country is quivering right now. I think everybody's got a little bit of that little dog in them, seeing what's going on in this nation, how the rats on the left have ganged up on the president, how the stoners who pass for uh, philosophers on late-night television, they're nothing but stand-up comedians who got a good agent. They don't know what the hell they're talking about. They've read other people's scripts their entire life. They're not known for any ideas of their own, and we're supposed to listen to them as they mock the president. These schmucks who don't know the time of day unless someone tells it to them. If they didn't have an iPhone, they couldn't add 2 and 16. But watching the PBS series last night, as I was saying, on the Civil War, I heard about, I heard a word that I haven't heard in a long time. And it was about compromise. And the narrator, David McCulloch, was reading, I guess, the script written by Shelby Foote, the historian. And he said that America is a nation uh, built on compromise. That's why we have Democrats versus Republicans. And all of our laws are written as a result of compromise. And he said, somehow the compromise failed at the outset of the Civil War. And my friends, right now we are going through the same uncompromising situation, where the vermin on the left, who are the most violent people in this country right now, and they have no idea what they're doing by provoking the Nazis and the KKK and the alt-right, and the deplorables, because they're now lumping us all together. I will tell you right now, if you keep poking with a stick, eventually you're going to get bitten. And what happened this weekend is just the beginning of what's going to happen if they're not stopped. And the police failed to stop them because the police wanted the riots. Because, in my opinion, the governor wanted the riots. 
so he could get up there and crow like a great leader. By the way, the biggest loser of this whole charade of the riots uh, in, in Virginia was the man who would be president, this Terry McAuliffe. He looked like a putz. He looked like a loser, a schmuck. He looked like an idiot from a college campus. He said everything wrong that he could, that could be said wrong in one sentence. He said it over and over again. His career just died because he did not show leadership. He showed no leadership. He showed none whatsoever. And the beautiful part about the left right now is that you're going to see them all trying to compete with each other to be who could be more of a communist. They're all trying to outdo Bernie Sanders about being a street agitator. Hillary's going to be back. The fake Indian, the faux Indian from up in the north there, I don't even know her name, Warren. The faux Indians trying to be more to the left of them. Everyone who gets up there tries to be more to the left than the other one. And guess what? All they're doing is moving the white working man and woman away from them. The problem for the Republicans is we don't have a real leader right now. What happened here with Trump is a story that needs to be told at another time. And I will tell it at another time, not now, because I've started three or four other topics. And I want to go back to my topics of the day, which are right up there on the board and right up there for you to call. I'll take your calls right now on the Savage Nation. But remember the key word here, compromise. Compromise is the way forward for America. This is what I learned last night as I went back to school in my studies of the Civil War by watching that PBS documentary. Laugh if you will, it's superbly well done, very well researched. The historian uh, who was quoted, Shelby Foote, was just fabulous. And what a wonderful speaker he is. I think he has since passed away. David McCulloch, the narrator of the PBS series. This is from 1990. And it was done at a time when America was a far more balanced place, by the way, than it is now. It seems so long ago, doesn't it? 1990, can you believe? It's been 27 years since the Civil War series on PBS. Can you imagine PBS doing a fair-minded series like that today? Everything they do is anti-family, anti-church, anti-American, but most importantly, anti-Trump. Oh, look at me, I hate Trump. Oh, look at me, I hate Trump, I'm a funny man. Oh, look at me, I hate Trump, buy my movie. Oh, look at me, I'm in a new movie, I hate Trump. Oh, look at me, so the sluts of Hollywood no longer have to strip tease to get your attention. All they have to do is go on a late-night show where a, a drunk dummy or a stone dummy is running it, and say they hate Trump and the audience gives a fake laugh. You hear this, the country we're living in today? The only solution here is compromise. Now, I happen to be a man who finds compromise very difficult. I'll be the first to admit it. I'm hard-headed. I'm opinionated. That's why I'm very good at what I do. But I'm willing to compromise for the way forward in this country. Are you? Are you willing to compromise to go forward in this country? Because if you don't, if you Johnnies of the left keep this up, you're going to burn this nation to the ground. And I don't want that to happen. I don't want that to happen at all. Let's take some calls. How's that? Anthony on WABC, Line 8 out of New York City. Go ahead, Anthony. What's on your mind? Hey, Dr. Savage. I heard you mention that um, the book with somebody up there likes me with Rocky Graciano. And mm -hmm. I'm sure aware of it. They made a movie out of it with Paul Newman. And yep. there's one, sex, one part in the film where he's in Chicago, gets his life back. He's going to have the fight, the big fight with Zale. He gets this and he flies back to New York. He's in the soda shop with the uh, Jewish shop owner, and basically the shop owner scolds him and says, you do something in life, you come in here, you order an ice cream soda, you got to pay the check. You do something bad outside, you got to pay the check. And basically I think that's what's wrong with America today. People are, uh, they just don't take responsibility for their actions. Well, I can't generalize. Everyone I know takes great responsibility for their actions. I mean, I can't speak for the next person. I know I'm, respon I'm responsible for every word that I say on this show. I walk on a tightrope 10,000 feet in the air, and if I say one wrong word, I slip off that tightrope forever. Trust me, I take responsibility for my actions, and by your voice, I assume you do as well. I do. I grew up in New York. So, I, so Well, here's, here's the point. The point is, is don't worry about the next man. Tend to your own garden. That's all we can do at the end of the day. The police are there to make sure that if a man steps out of line and does not take responsibility for his actions, as we saw amongst the left uh, in Charlottesville and in Oakland and in Berkeley and in New York, when these left-wing agitators go over the line, the police are supposed to stop them. 
And they did not do their job in my estimation. Thank you for that call. See, I'm trying to be compromising here in some way. And uh, I don't know if I'm getting anywhere with it. So before I take a break on the show, boy, time is a flying. Before I know it, I'll be sitting in front of a television screen late tonight as it comes down out of the ceiling. I love those screens with a projector on it. Wow, I went to someone's house who has one. I'm like living in the age of like a black and white. I don't, I don't have, a, I have a great TV, but if you don't have a screen like with beads in it, with a projector that comes out of the ceiling, it's like you're sitting in one of those small movie theaters. Maybe that's why Teddy is shaking. Maybe the sound scared him of the Civil War. When I come back, we're going to play one of the worst street rats in modern American political history, in my opinion, Bernie Sanders, who is a very intelligent man who knows much better, and he knows what he is doing, this street rat, this street agitator, this commie, Bernie Sanders, saying Donald Trump is responsible for the Charlottesville terror attack. Bernie, I would say shame on you, but a man like you is shameless. Back in a minute. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. The Savage Nation is sponsored by Swiss America, the only company I trust with my financial future. Call 800-289-2646 or SwissAmerica.com. Dr. Michael Savage, back with you. I've been talking about the amazing benefits you get with Super Beets for quite a while, haven't I? Well, why? Because Super Beets is one of the most impressive natural functional foods I've ever seen in my career. It's got to do with blood flow, blood flow, blood flow. What does that mean? Beets are loaded with dietary nitrates. They convert to nitric oxide in the body. Super Beets is the easiest way to get these natural dietary nitrates to specifically help you with blood flow and circulation. Super Beets works three times faster. To give you results, you can feel. Plus, it tastes great. You will feel the energy and stamina it gives you within 20 minutes of taking it. And I want you to feel it. If you haven't tried it, now is the time. Because for a limited time, you'll get 10, 10 on-the-go packets of Super Beats to pop in your desk drawer, your purse, or your gym bag. More energy, more stamina, support healthy circulation. What are you waiting for? This is on top of the free canister, free indicator strips, and a free book plus free shipping with your first order when you call 800-481-0504. Write it down. 800-481-0504. Or go to savagelovesbeats.com. That's savagelovesbeats.com. It's guaranteed or you get your money back, right? Call 800-481-0504. It's all natural. That's 800-481-0504. Go to savagelovesbeats.com. Write it down. That's savagelovesbeats.com. Now, we're talking about the Civil War. We're talking about the only solution is compromise between the left and the right in America right now. But the left is at war, and most of the people who voted for Trump are not at war. They're at work. Write that one down. And this very small group in Charlottesville of Nazis, Ku Klux Klan members, they were the smallest of the small number of those who attended the rally, by the way. It was not primarily a KKK or Nazi rally, incidentally. It was a lot of hardcore white nationalists, but not exclusively white nationalists, incidentally, and KKK and Nazis, who had a permit. A federal judge granted them the right to march because we do live in a nation that permits free speech and free assembly. But the left doesn't want you to have free speech or free assembly. They don't want them to have it. They don't want me to have it. They don't want anyone on radio who doesn't agree with the communist or Bolshevik agenda to have it. And so we're talking about compromise is the only solution. That's what we're talking about. I just got an email about the Civil War, and I was talking about Lee, who Lincoln, as I told you, President Lincoln, first offered General Lee the command of the Union Army. I don't think you know that, because he was such a brilliant brilliant man and a brilliant uh, leader in military history. He was already pretty brilliant. And he went home and thought about it. He said, no, I won't stab my own state in the back. So he became the head of the um, Southern Army, the rebels. So someone wrote me this, very, very keen. I hope I have the time. God, this is such a little time. I can't read it. I can't read this. But it's about Lee's ultimate surrender to the Union and that he may have done it on purpose. He did it to protect his home of Virginia. It's an interesting theory. 
It's an interesting theory, which I will read to you in the next hour. Because there are people out there who can still think. I hope you're one of them. I hope you're not one of those college teachers who was on uh, tenure, who puts on a mask on the weekends in Berkeley and breaks store windows while you're on tenure. Because if it was up to me, I'd bust you, I'd take your pension away. Governor Brown, pay attention. We're not going to tolerate the violence of the left. Moonbeam, come in. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of borders, language, culture, and here he is, winner of the National Radio Hall of Fame Award, Michael Savage. Welcome back to the Savage Nation. Here we are, our number two already. We're talking about, oh, so many different topics. Uh, today we're going to focus a little more on how anti-white rhetoric is fueling white nationalism with David Marcus from the Federalist uh, publication. I'm going to ask you, how can we take an actor or comedian's political viewpoint seriously when all they do is read scripts? They're nothing but, sca- they're nothing but stand-up comics, comics who got lucky and a good agent. It's that simple. And are we now all fascists for believing in America? And I was talking about watching the Civil War series done in 1990 by Ken Burns, the documentarian. Uh, I watched it last night for two hours. I was just fascinated, captive. I've always loved documentaries, but this time I was older and wiser and watched it with a different, just a different set of eyes, okay? And I learned so much. And the, the num- one of the main things I learned was that uh, it was because there was a lack of compromise that the Civil War grew into this slaughterhouse. And we're now at a point of no compromise in this country, and it's going to get worse unless there's some compromise on the part of the left. They're out of control. They need to be stopped, and the police need to step in and stop them so we don't have more Charlottesvilles. And I was talking about General Lee, uh, the great Confederate general who was first offered the job, Robert E. Lee, of running the Union Army by Lincoln. And he thought about it, and he came back in the morning. Well, let me play that little piece for you again. Uh, the little one, Robert. Would you please play that one for the listeners who just joined us? It's very important you hear this. On April 18th, four days after Sumter, Lee was summoned to Blair House at Lincoln's behest and offered field command of the entire Union Army. Lee said he would think about it. Virginia had voted to secede the day before. That night, he paced anxiously in the gardens around his Arlington mansion across the Potomac. At midnight, Saturday the 20th, Lee wrote his letter of resignation from the United States Army. On the 21st, the governor of Virginia asked Lee to take command of the state militia. When Lee had to choose between the nation and Virginia, there was never any any doubt about what his choice would be. He went with his state, and he said, I can't draw my sword against my native state, or or as he often said, my country. All right, welcome back to the program. So you heard that General Lee, the the statue, right, the statue guy that the vermin on the left have turned into Hitler, was by far not a Hitler. He was no Hitler. He was not a Hitler, okay? But that doesn't appease the vermin on the left who need to be stopped by the federal government and put in jail if they do any more of this violence, whether it's in Oakland, Berkeley, San Francisco, New York, or Charlottesville, I want them put in prison. This is not freedom of speech. This is violence, God darn it. Where the hell is the government on this? Where was the governor of Virginia, McCull- whatever his name is, the schmuck fundraiser for Bill Clinton? He is the one who is responsible for this. And if we don't have any compromise, this country is going to go up in flames. The government needs to step in, the federal government, because the local governments are out of control by permitting this left-wing fascism to rise. Whether it's stopping a speaker on a campus, 
or ripping down a statue, which is breaking a law. Next, they'll take down the Ten Commandments monuments and you'll do nothing. Or they'll take jackhammers to the uh, Mount Rushmore statues and you'll do nothing. You think these vermin have the right to do this? They're doing just what ISIS did when they took over Palmyra. It's domestic terrorism by any other name. Don't give me their reasons. I'm not interested in the reasons of, vi of violent individuals. Now, going back to the issue of General Robert E. Lee, I have a contributor to the show who's been anonymous until this time, and now I've been told I can mention the anonymous person's name. I don't know if they really want me to do this because she's smart. But she sent something about the... Um, I have to find it now in the middle of a show. It's not easy for me to do all of this. A theory on Lee's surrender, all right? And it was sent to me by a Miss Bragg, I guess Ms. Bragg. And Ms. Bragg writes the following about a theory regarding General Lee's surrender, ending the Civil War. And she writes this. Do you know if it might be reasonable to have any suspicion about Lee's ultimate surrender to the Union? Consider the following. One, he wanted to avoid secession and revolution. Lee didn't want to destroy the Union. And three, Lee wanted to protect his home state of Virginia. Couldn't it be argued that it would satisfy all three of these goals to pursue a position of power over the Confederate Army in order to eventually surrender, first to Grant and then ultimately to the Union by refusing to go along with the other Southern officers who wanted to continue to fight for secession by means of guerrilla warfare? She finishes by asking, he's been accused of foolishly using aggressive tactics when defensive strategy was obviously advisable due to the South's manpower disadvantage. Was it foolish or was it because he wanted to end the war as soon as possible to avoid unnecessary damage and casualties to the South and also didn't want to defeat the Union, so he had to get the point of being able to wave the South's white flag, which he obviously could only do from within? I can't answer that question. It's certainly worthy of a master's or Ph.D. dissertation, incidentally. It's a great, great theory that would be that makes for the kind of thing that makes for a great dissertation, by the way. Or a, or a master's degree thesis, if they still do them anymore. As someone who's gone through that laborious process at a great university, trust me, there's very little original thinking. This is a fabulous Ph.D. dissertation idea right here, and worthy of a dissertation and a Ph.D., incidentally, if it could be articulated properly through, uh, through proper referencing. But it's a big job. But for the purposes of this show, I want to go back to the main questions that we are talking about, and the best way to do it is to talk with the listeners. Again, don't miss the main point that I learned last night in watching that series all over again. I had known this and forgotten it. It's most important that you hear me. Uh, President Lincoln did not prosecute the Civil War because of slavery. Initially, he fought with the South over the issue of secession from the Union. Slavery was a secondary issue, and they merged about the middle of the Civil War. It was not primarily slavery that motivated Lincoln. I don't know if you know that. It's important that you do know that. Did you hear what I just said to you? This is probably the most important thing you could learn today. This is not to support slavery. Any human being on earth opposes slavery if they're a sane, decent man or woman. We all know that. There's nothing worse that could be done to a human being than to enslave them. Of course, there's slavery going on right now. There is no slavery in America. I guess I need to remind you of that, all you victims. Uh... But you're not a slave. You have freedom. You have ultimate freedom like people have never had in the history of the world. And if you want to walk around talking about slavery your whole life, you're going, to be in, you're going to enslave yourself for the rest of your life. I've said the same thing over and over again. If you walk around with the victim card, all you're doing is imprisoning yourself and keeping yourself down. I've said this about Jewish people who continue to harp on the Holocaust. No, we must never forget slavery. No, we must never forget the Holocaust. But if you make the Holocaust your reason to live as a Jew, then you're not really a Jew. What you're doing here is imprisoning yourself in the Holocaust mentality, which makes you a victim and a slave. Do you understand that? I don't think it, it, this is an evolved point of view that's very hard to get, along, to get through to liberals. They don't understand it. And it makes them very mean. And it also gives them the justification for doing, doing almost anything they want because they have this attitude that something was done to their ancestors that somehow reflects upon their uh, reasonable ability to do anything to you. I don't like it. But that's the main point, is that the Civil War was fought primarily over secession. They did not want the southern states, Lincoln didn't want the southern states to leave the Union. 
I also learned during the series, which I didn't know, that the South vastly out, uh, was vastly outnumbered by the North. I didn't really know that. I had forgotten that the North was far more populous and that the Southern Army was about one-fifth the size uh, of the Northern Armies, which, by the way, may explain why Lee took an aggressive posture. So I don't know that I 100% agree with the theory that was presented to me by uh, Ms. Bragg. I would think that if you're a smaller fighter in a ring with a bigger fighter, the only way to defeat the bigger fighter is not to do a defensive fight, but to be more aggressive than the bigger fighter. I've seen it 100 times in the ring, if I've seen it once. The little guy will always come out swinging and hitting, and it usually will back the big guy off if you hit hard enough and fast enough. So I don't know that Lee did it in order to uh, compromise and lose the war, so just for whatever that's worth. It's just another theory. Okay, we're moving along. We're into hour number two. I hope the computer is unfrozen in Dallas. I'll be right back right here on The Savage Nation. Join The Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. The Savage Nation is sponsored by Swiss America, the only company I trust with my financial future. Call 800-289-2646 or SwissAmerica.com. Now for a little fun. There's a series on Showtime called Shameless, which I don't watch. I don't like it. It's about a dysfunctional family, about this guy Frank Gallagher. I, I don't enjoy it. It's just about a messed up guy. But it's written by very intelligent people. The writers, the TV writers are really smart people, which is why we watch these shows. It's all about the writing generally. So there's a Frank Galla- Gallagher speech from the Showtime show about freedom, where, you know, he's a drunk and a stoner. But listen to the writing of this speech about freedom on the Savage Nation. Look, it's okay to write about mass murderers. You just can't side with the mass murderers. Uh, This is a direct attack on his First Amendment rights, a right, I might add, that belongs to everyone, regardless of intelligence deficiencies or possible retardation. Yes, but there are conditions to those rights, like yelling fire in a public theater, preaching white supremacy to middle school students. Look, we simply can't allow Hitler's hate speech to alienate our diverse student body. We've worked very hard to create an open atmosphere for all our students. Look, you can't go teaching equality and then get your human rights panties in a bunch when it comes with a couple of wedgies. Every asshole is entitled to his beliefs. That's the yin and the yang of democracy. It's the same freedom that allows you to teach wearing that silly beanie and those Crayola-colored kids out there to go to school together. And it, it doesn't matter anyway. Pretty soon, there's not going to be any Jew or Aryan or Hindu or Muslim or Mexican or Blacks. It's just going to be the rich and the f- And our grandson is already one of the f- So at least let the boy express the degenerate ideas he can actually comprehend. And that, my multicultural friends, is liberty. (laughs) It's very funny. It's it's very funny. In other words, shut your mouths and let someone else speak for a minute. And if you pick up a stick, you're not a liberal. If you pick up a stick, you are a fascist. The definition of the word fascist is using fascia, which is a stick. Look up the Latin root of the word fascia, moron. And I want the police to stop them across America. And if you police don't stop them, you're breaking the law. That's my opinion. That's the Savage Nation's opinion. I hope it becomes your opinion. Robert on WABC on line six. Line six on this Tuesday of ours. Robert from WABC, go ahead, please. How are you, Dr. Savage? Two things. I believe compromise on the left is totally gone. And I'm a fair and balanced person. I try to listen to both sides. But I'm finding my ability to compromise is diminishing based on what I hear on the news. Uh, one more thing. Uh, sometimes I watch CNN, MSNBC, and I watch this Van Jones, and he called this election a whitewash. And I would like you to tell me how many whitewashed people it would take to elect Obama two consecutive terms. Well, first of all, Van Jones is an avowed communist, so dismiss everything he says. Okay, never believe a word he says. He is speaking from the Red Book, the communist playbook. He may as well be Mao Zedong, period, end of story. I don't take that clown seriously. Why would you? Now, I've got to play another soundbite for you, and that is uh, Bernie Sanders, who is a street radical of the worst kind, a gutter rat agitator, 
who holds Donald Trump responsible for the Charlottesville terror attack. Listen to this rat who knows better. He's not just a left-wing college teacher, which we expect this kind of rhetoric from. He is a man who would be president, and he knows better than this. A man in, enmeshed in a scandal in Vermont with his wife and the college and the funds and ripping off funds and ripping off funds with a college thing. One of the most intelligent men in politics is Bernie Sanders and one of the most dangerous. Listen to 05. Look, I think it is when you have a president who doesn't have the guts to say what the vast majority of the people understand to be true, that white supremacy and neo-Nazism have got to be condemned, he can't even do that. The message he is sending out to racists and neo-Nazis all over the country is it's okay. Hey, in fact, you heard some language for that. The president hasn't condemned us. Why don't we do more rallies? Why don't we spread the word of white supremacy and racism and neo-Nazism? So do I think the president bears some responsibility for that? Absolutely, yes. Well, I think you bear more responsibility for it, Bernie. Personally, I think you are the one who is inflaming white nationalism and white racism, Bernie. It's men like you who are flaring people up and pushing them over the edge. Personally, Bernie, I think you, you're more responsible for it. You and Katzenberg, you and all the others who hate the white race. And you do, Bernie. Everything that comes out of your mouth is against whites and against nationalism. Have you recently said anything good about anything to do with this nation, Bernie? When is the last time you said anything positive about the nation, Bernie? You are the type of gutter rat that sinks nations. And yet you did very well in the uh, last presidential election, didn't you? Were it not for WikiLeaks, not the Russians, by the way. Hey, by the way, whatever happened with the Russian investigation, Bernie? We were hearing Russia, 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 Russia. It went on and on and on, like a white Russian. I'm combining the two, white and Russian. Russia, 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 Russia. That's eight months of Russia, 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 Russia. All of a sudden now they have a new one. Charlottesville, 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 Charlottesville. They've gone from Russia, Russia, Russia. Now that there's nothing in why don't they hire uh, another special prosecutor now? Maybe, uh, what's his name? I forgot his name. Oh, Mueller. Not even, I can't remember his name anymore. Why don't they hire another Mueller now and give him unlimited money to look into the Charlottesville terror attack and see if they can prove that Donald Trump orchestrated it all? Then you can say Russia and Charlottesville, Bernie. You're a deranged man for many reasons, Bernie, but the main reason you're deranged, Sanders, is because you're a very intelligent deranged man. And you know that your kind of rhetoric is not the kind that we need uh, in the political world today. All right, you got my opinion. When we come back, we will discuss how anti-white rhetoric is fueling white nationalism. It's an important article written by David Marcus in the Federalist magazine. The last I checked, I didn't know, I, I didn't check its kosher qualifications. For all I know, the Federalist is a neo-Nazi publication. Is it, Robert? Because I didn't think so. No, I didn't think, I think it was simply a good conservative publication that focused on federal issues from the constitutional point of view. But I guess the Constitution itself can be seen as a, uh, a hate document written by white racists who own slaves. And I think it's time for us to tear up all copies of the U.S. Constitution, blow up every Ten Commandments monument, and jackhammer Mount Rushmore. How's that? Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. We're going to talk about Charlottesville now, and we have a guest from the Federalist publication on the Savage Nation, John Daniel Davidson, who writes that Charlottesville, is this the article that we're talking about, Robert? I hope it is. <laughs> no, we're talking about the other article. Okay, there were two great articles in the Federalist, and this is uh, by David Marcus, how anti-white rhetoric is fueling white nationalism. David Marcus, welcome with the Savage Nation. Welcome to the Savage Nation. Oh, okay. What is your ma what is your main theme, Mr. Marcus? I'm sorry. What is your main theme? Uh, my my main theme is that I, I believe at first inadvertently uh, the left has begun to discuss white people, in particularly um, white men, 
in a way that they originally meant ironically to 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 say, look, um, let's not have people be representatives of their race. Let, let, let's treat everybody as individuals. That has right. turned into a situation where they really believe now that white men are particularly dangerous and pernicious. Um, and we see a lot of we see a lot of articles uh, along these lines. We see a lot of things going on on college campuses along these lines. And I have a very real fear that this rhetoric is in fact helping the the really awful people who are out there trying to recruit young white men into white nationalism and white supremacy. Where is this coming from? Who is pushing this rhetoric? It's been a long time coming. Um, I, I, I think that the central theme is something called privilege theory that began in the late 1980s. Um, the, uh, there was a woman named Peggy McIntosh who, who wrote an essay called uh, Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack. And the idea is that white people have hidden advantages within our society that they have to acknowledge and mm. uh, confess to. Mm. Now, I differ, I differ from many conservatives in, in that I, I, I do actually believe that this, dis- this describes something that actually exists in society. I do think white people in our society have advantages. But this, this way of thinking has become the primary tool that we use to fight racism. And, and instead of saying, don't judge people by the color of their skin, we now say, think of everybody based on the color of their skin and judge them accordingly. And, and well, no matter I'll, tell you where we di- I'll tell you where we disagree. Work out well. Maybe in the 1950s the white person had an advantage, but I don't think anyone living in America today can say that the white man has an advantage when every college in America, without exception, tries to get minorities, women, illegal immigrants, transgenders to apply for scholarships, apply for positions in teaching, and step over more qualified white men. Everyone knows that's going on. Yeah, I, look, I, that, 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 that absolutely is going on, and I think that there's an important conversation to be had about set-aside programs. But I live in New York City, and I've watched cabs drive by black men in suits. I've had people who I'm trying to rent an apartment from say to me, you know, we're not going to rent this apartment to Arabs. I mean, like, let's, we can't pretend what we saw in Charlottesville showed us very clearly that there are still people in America today who hold these reprehensible, bigoted views. So well, no one's de- no one's denying that, but now what we, have- we also can't deny that the bigoted, the views that hate white people are also bigoted, can we? Of course they are. Of course they are. And so the question is, how do we fight this? And I think that in the 1970s and the 1980s, we, we, we were on the right track because what we believed in was a colorblind society. White people tuned into the Cosby show, and they didn't think, hey, these are black people. They thought this is a family. Mm-hmm. But this is a family, and, and, and it's just like my family. And, and, and that was the right answer. That got perverted into this, this, this privilege theory, hierarchy of oppression concept where, where white people are supposed to confess their guilt. Well, wait a minute. This is, right out of the, this is right out of the communist playbook. You well know. You're a very intelligent, well-read, excuse me, well-read man. You know what happened after the Red Brigades took over China unleashed on the middle class by Mao Zedong. It had nothing to do with race. It had to do with class warfare, where they took the middle class professor or engineer, anyone who had anything, and made them confess to their sins against the poor people. This is a class war, I think, more than it is a race war. Maybe. I, 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 I don't know. It's, it, it's so fraud. We're, we're, at a such, we're at such a dangerous moment. In our in our body politic right now, and and we right. really need we really need a, a, a leader. You know, I called on Trump yesterday to, to in, in, in an article in City Journal to to address this. You know, I, I he, he says he can unite us. I, I want to believe him. This is the moment where where that has to happen. 
Well, well, you wrote a great article called An- How Anti-White Rhetoric is Fueling White Nationalism, and I think that I'd like to stick to that theme for a moment. Sure. If you continue to vilify and marginalize poor white men, where do you leave them room? Where do they go? Tell me where they wind up going. I think, I, I think they wind up in the alt-right. Well, what is the alt-right? Define that for me. It's, it's, I, that, that, that's a complicated question. I, 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 would, I would say that the alt-right is a group of mainly white people, not only white people, interestingly, though. There, there, there are certainly other, other people involved who want to mimic the left's aggressive style of race baiting. And I, I see them as two sides of the same coin. I, I, I think that I think that on the one side, you have a left that, that wants to, to run all these articles in, in Teen Vogue and everybody and, and every place else about, you know, the, here's why white men are terrible. And now you have Milo and, and, and all the figures on, on the alt-right who say, well, we'll come right back at you. I, I think uh, yeah, but Milo is gay. I mean, have you have you lost that in your translation? Milo is a gay white man. How could he suddenly be a, fa- a, ra- a racist and a fascist? Well, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I, I think a gay guy can be a racist and a fascist. I, I understand, I, but all of a sudden, anybody who's a nationalist is automatically now a racist? No. Well, let me ask you, David, I don't know you, you don't know me. Do you assume that any nationalist is automatically a racist? I, I don't know what you mean by nationalist. Um, no, I, I... Well, okay, the theme of my show for 22 years has been borders, language, culture. Are those <laughs> racist terms to you? No, absolutely not. Here, here, here's my point. When you, when you meet somebody, you deal with them as an individual. The color of their skin has nothing to do with, 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 with anything. Well, I wouldn't agree with that. I think people look at everything the minute that, you know, I have a neuropsychiatrist, a friend who's a neuropsychiatrist, who said to me uh, that the minute we meet someone and talk to them, within a few milliseconds, our brain processes megadata and decides immediately whether we can get along with that person. And one of the things we look at is the eyes, the nose, the shape of the hair, the scent, and, of course, their race. It's all computed almost immediately. Right. But most of us living in a multicultural society can overlook race because we have come to understand that race is not the defining factor amongst most civilized people. It is amongst some, but not amongst all. So we overlook race, but we certainly see the race of a person. And I think Christ came to us to tell us that's not the way you ought to treat people. And, and, and I think on some level, you know, you know, he and science tells us that's an irrational way to treat people. Demographics are made up of individuals. Individuals are not made up of, of demographics. When you meet somebody and they have a certain skin tone, what does that tell you about them? Well, I want to ask you about your article, David. You wrote it in The Federalist. It caught my attention how anti-white rhetoric is fueling white nationalism. That's a great theme, because, again, let's go back to the poor white men in the South. If you keep calling them Nazi and Ku Klux Klan when some of them are and some of them are not, what is that going to do to those who are not? It's going to drive them in, in, into the hands of those who are. That's, I, think one of, well, I think that's a theme of your article. Yes. So when, when are we going to have the left stop this hatred, this racial hatred towards white males? <clears throat> I, I, I don't know. Um, I, I, I hope that uh, I, I hope that it stops. I, I, I don't see a lot of evidence that it will. But I, I would say to those of us on the right, um, you know, d- don't take this bait. It, 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 as awful as this rhetoric is, we need to. We need to respond in a more positive way. I mean, I agree with you. I talked about compromise today. I was talking about the Civil War and how in in studying the Civil War all over again, uh, the narrator of that great PBS series on the Civil War, which I rewatched last night for two straight hours, Shelby Foote, the historian, said that America was a great nation of compromise. And what happened with the Civil War was that people would not compromise and and it went to the to the ultimate level of killing their brother or their cousin. And I'm afraid we're almost there again, David, because these people on the left came there armed with sticks and stones and feces and urine and flamethrowers. I saw the pictures, David. 
They're out of control. I live here in San Francisco. These vermin on the left will close highways. They beat people up. They stop people from speaking. Is this civil dialogue? No, it's not. But let's not forget that it was it was it, it was not one of them who drove a car into human beings. We, we all yes, but hey, he's been char- he's been charged. Wait, he's been charged with homicide. It's been called a hate crime. What more needs to be done now? Must we all genuflect and take responsibility for the maniac in the car? Well, no, we don't need to genuflect in, unless we feel maybe a, a need to look towards God in this moment, which, which maybe we should, quite frankly. Well, I began the show, strangely enough, by reading the Ten Commandments. It probably went over the heads of most listeners, left and right. But, David, in your article, How Anti-White Rhetoric is Fueling White Nationalism, you, you, key point, you keynote some uh, statements. In the past year, you write, all of the following headlines have appeared in well-read publications. One, the white guy problem. Two, white men must be stopped. The very future of mankind depends on it. Three, I don't know what to do with good white people. Four, ten things white people need to stop saying. Uh, uh, Next point, dear white people, these are a list of things we'd wish you'd stop doing. What kind of garbage is this? This is outright South African racism. It's a prelude to the necklacing of people in the streets, David. It's bad. It's bad. I know you're trying, look, David, I know you're trying to heal. I know you're trying to heal the nation, and I really, I really respect your writing. Trust me. I have very few guests on this show, but I think you're a keen intellect, and I really loved your article. I recommend people read it in The Federalist. I put it up on michaelsavage.com, and I, re- I really ke- hope you keep up writing and you keep referencing compromise and God, David. David Marcus of The Federalist, thank you very much for being with us on The Savage Nation. It's 46 minutes after the hour. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. The Savage Nation is sponsored by Swiss America, the only company I trust with my financial future. Call 800-289-2646 or SwissAmerica.com. Oh, it's the summer. In the middle of the night, you're tossing and turning, covered in sweat. Well, you can run the AC all night, right? Do you want to do that? Why don't you just get rid of your heat-trapping mattress and sleep as cool as the other side of the pillow? Mm, that's great. On a Casper mattress, it's made of two high-tech foams, which guarantee you sleep cool, comfortable, and fully supported every night. It comes to you for free in a box so small you won't believe it holds a mattress. It's that small. Casper does that so you can try it for risk-free. For 100 nights in your own home. If you don't love it, they'll come pick it up and refund you everything from its breakthrough design and superior quality to its packaging and 100 night in home trial. It is no wonder that Casper was named one of Fast Company's 50 most innovative brands of 2017. So try your Casper for 100 nights with free shipping and returns. All you got to do is go to Casper.com, code Savage, and you're going to get $50 towards the purchase of your mattress. That's Casper.com, code Savage. And get fifty dollars towards the purchase of this great mattress. Casper.com. Terms and conditions do apply. The president just gave a press conference where he blamed both sides for Charlottesville because both sides have blame. I've been doing so for two days, but because he did not genuflect and fall down and apologize for the Ku Klux Klan, all of the left-wing vermin ripped him apart. Do you see the bias in the media? The Noah Bermans of the L.A. Times and the others, they don't give the man a break. They don't want compromise. They want war. The American press is at war not only with Donald Trump. Make no mistake about it. The American press is at war with everyone who voted for Donald Trump. The American the press, is, the American press, if you want to call them that, I don't call them the American press. They're not the fourth estate. They're the fifth column. They're the fifth column of Karl Marx. So I want you to hear some of what just went on, and you'll see why we hate the American media. Listen carefully. When you say the alt-right, uh, define alt-right to me. You define it. Go ahead. Well, I'm saying, as no, Senator, define it for me. Come on. Let's go. Define Senator it. Senator McCain defined them as the same group. Okay, what about the alt-left that came Day. charging at Excuse me. What about the alt-left that came charging at the, as you say, the alt-right? Do they have any semblance of guilt? This is what, let me ask you this. What about the fact they came charging, that they came charging with clubs in their hands, swinging clubs? Do they have any problem? I think they do. Sorry, so, you know, as far as I'm concerned, 
That was a horrible, horrible day. Wait a minute. I'm not finished. I'm not finished, fake news. That was a horrible day. I will tell you something. I watched those very closely, much more closely than you people watched it. And you have uh, you, you had a group on one side that was bad, and you had a group on the other side that was also very violent. And nobody wants to say that, but I'll say it right now. You had a group, you had a group on the other side that came charging in without a permit, and they were very, very violent. Go ahead. Do you think that the, what you call the alt-left is the same as neo-Nazis? Oh, those people, all of those people, excuse me. I've condemned neo-Nazis. I've condemned many different groups, but not all of those people were neo-Nazis. Believe me, right. not all of those people were right. white supremacists. Right. By any stretch. Those people were right. also there. Shut the chick up. Shut a little yap for her. I can't take it anymore. Finally, we have an American president. Someone with the guts to stand up to these communist vermin. You can't compromise with psychos. Shut him down. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE. 855-400-7282. Savage. Warning. The Savage Nation contains adult language. Adult content, psychological nudity, listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of borders, language, culture, and here he is, winner of the National Radio Hall of Fame Award, Michael Savage. You know, the truth is marching on, and the vermin in the media who have eaten, slept, and drunk with lies are shocked. Trump's been calling the vermin in the media purveyors of fake news. Well, he's right in a certain way. But it just dawned on me in watching the latest press charade put on by the media that we're not really watching fake news makers. We're watching those who want outcome-based news. You haven't heard that phrase yet. I realize the uh, media is uh, devoid of ideas. But outcome-based news is what you're watching. So when Trump gets up and blames both sides for the Charlottesville murder, the vermin on the left in the media who want outcome-based news go crazy. They went berserk. They went insane. They're in overdrive, hating him for not saying that it's the people who rallied there yesterday. He also had the, the nerve to say to the girls in the media that uh, not all those people in the park were Nazis or Ku Klux Klan members. He dared say that he actually studied the issue. He dared say to them, you haven't studied the issue. They went berserk. From the L.A. Times to the New York Times, they went crazy because he tried to compromise. What's odd here is that it was a lack of compromise that caused the Civil War. And I will remind all of you on the illegitimate left that Barack Obama, after all the murders by Black Lives Matter inspired murderers, got up there and tried to compromise by blaming both sides in some way. But the media didn't say anything to Obama because he was above reproach. So you have to admit at the bottom of it that the media hates this man primarily because he's a white male. Moreover, he also has the effrontery to be a heterosexual white male who is married and has children and grandchildren. There can be no greater crimes to the illegitimate left than to be a white, a male, heterosexual Christian married with children and grandchildren. So they hate him for these things. So he blames both sides for Charlottesville, and they go berserk. I want you to listen now to what just happened in your country because of the illegitimate left-wing uh, in the press. Listen carefully. Mr. President, are you putting what you're calling the alt-left 
and white supremacists on the same moral plane. I'm not putting anybody on a moral plane. What I'm saying is this. You had a group on one side and you had a group on the other, and they came at each other with clubs, and it was vicious, and it was horrible, and it was a horrible thing to watch. But there is another side. There was a group on this side, you can call them the left, you've just called them the left, that came violently attacking the other group. So you can say what you want, but that's the way it is. So you said there was hatred, there was violence on both sides. Uh, are well, I do think there's blame. The yes, I think there's blame on both sides. You look at you look at both sides. I think there's blame on both sides, and I have no doubt about it. And you don't have any doubt about it either. And, only and, 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 and if you reported it accurately, you would say. Not Kill the person. This. They Heather showed up in Charlottesville. They, started, they showed up in Charlottesville Excuse me. to protest. Excuse the me. They didn't put themselves down as you. And you had some very bad people in that group. But you also had people that were very fine people on both sides. You had people in that group. Excuse me. Excuse me. I saw the same pictures as you did. You had people in that group that were there to protest the taking down of, to them, a very, very important statue and the renaming of a park from Robert E. Lee to another name. No, George Washington was a slave owner. Was George Washington a slave owner? So will George Washington now lose his status? Are we going to take down, excuse me, are we going to take down, are we going to take down statues to George Washington? How about Thomas Jefferson? What do you think oh, of Thomas you, Jefferson? Boy, this you like him? Good. Okay, good. Are we going to take down the statue? Because he was a major slave owner. Now, are we going to take down his statue? So you know what? It's fine. You're changing history. You're changing culture. And wow. you had people, and I'm not talking about the neo-Nazis and the white nationalists, because they should be condemned totally. But you had many people in that group other than neo-Nazis and white nationalists, okay? And the press has treated them absolutely unfairly. Now, in the other group also, you had some mm -hmm. fine people, but you also had troublemakers, and you see them come with the, with the black outfits and with the helmets and with the baseball bats. You got a, you had a lot of bad you had a lot of bad people in the other group too. Who was treated unfairly, sir? I'm sorry, I just didn't understand what you were saying. You were saying the press has treated white nationalists unfairly? No. I just didn't understand what you were saying. No. There were people in that rally, and I looked the night before. If you look, there were people protesting very quietly the taking down of the statue of Robert E. Lee. I'm sure in that group there were some bad ones. The following day, it looked like they had some rough, bad people, neo-Nazis, uh, white nationalists, whatever you want to call them. But you had a lot of people in that group that were there to innocently protest and very legally right. protest because, you know, right. I don't know if you know, they had a permit. The other group didn't have a permit. So I only tell you this. There are two sides to a story. I thought what took place was a horrible moment for our country, a horrible moment. But there are two sides to the country. I'm telling you, I'm more proud of President Trump today than I was the day I first started to support him and that I wrote the book Trump's War for so long. He is a great president. He has the nerve to stand up to these bullies with uh, iPhones called reporters in a way no one has ever stood up to them. They are outcome-based news people who want him to say what is not true in order to appease the left-wing mobs that have taken over the culture in this country. You see, there's been a march in this country that's gone on for decades now. where they've ta First, they came for the universities, and no one could stop them because the universities had no one to stand up to them. They took over the news media, slowly but surely. And they took over the political world, and they were sure that they were going to take over the world with the election of Hillary Clinton. And they're now insane with rage, and they want to take it all out on him. Now, he's talking about Charlottesville. Can anyone listening to this show not agree with the president when he says that the alt-left were the purveyors of violence in that altercation? They came to do harm. Trump says both sides to blame in Charlottesville violence. Reversing Monday stance is how the Wall Street Journal put it. That's because Murdoch, uh, Moloch, I call him affectionately, not so affectionately, Moloch has turned on Trump. Moloch is now working in cahoots with the deep state to overturn the presidency. Murdoch, or Moloch, as you would put it, is part and parcel of the deep state. Make no mistake about it, the American press is now in the hands 
of absolute and pure propagandists in a, in a way I've never seen it in my life. Here the president came out and tried to co- create compromise, and immediately the uh, illegitimate press from L.A. to New York attacks the president for being a, a man who tries to create compromise. What do you think of the president's comments? Did he do the right thing? I do think so. Can you honestly say after watching the flamethrowers, the feces, the urine, the sticks and the stones that were being thrown by the vermin on the left, that they were not equally responsible for the violence in Charlottesville? Who could actually say that? KLIF, Chuck, welcome to the Savage Nation from Dallas, Texas. Your opinion counts. Go ahead, please. Michael, I think it's wonderful that he come out in this fashion. He is citing something that they're not used to dealing with, Michael, and they're called facts. He is doing nothing but fighting. He's reached his limit. I do believe he's fed up with these people, damning the white people, the white man. He is pretty much, he's unbridled. He's going to let him have it straight away, Michael, and there's nothing. He's not afraid of these people. It's obvious he has no fear when he's dealing with these people. He, but you hear the high-pitched college girls going berserk, trying to blame <laughs> everything everything on those who rallied in defense of the Robert E. Lee statue, make all of a sudden painting them all as Nazis. He said they weren't all Nazis. He said not everyone there who was protesting the removal of the statue was a Nazi. He said what is obviously true, and the college chicks in the press went insane. Dealing with facts. All right, look, I, I, I've said this for years. I can see it as clear as a bell. When I come back, we'll talk more about Trump's comments. Who are, They're great. I think his, he is such a great leader right now. He is the first leader I have seen since Ronald Reagan who has the guts to stand up to these, these lemmings. I wouldn't even call them lemmings because lemmings just follow others over the cliff. These people are leading America over the cliff. I'll be back in a minute to take your calls. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. The Savage Nation is sponsored by Swiss America, the only company I trust with my financial future. Call 800-289-2646 or SwissAmerica.com. When you say the alt-right, define alt-right to me. You define it. Go ahead. No, define it for me. Come on, let's go. Senator McCain defined them as the same group. Okay, what about the alt-left that came charging him? Excuse me. What about the alt-left that came charging at the, as you say, the alt-right? Do they have any semblance of guilt? Let me ask you this. What about the fact they came charging? All hell just broke loose because the president of the United States of America just stood up to some ignoramus uh, with an iPhone who thinks she's a reporter. And she had the nerve to say, but Senator McCain said that the alt-right were all Nazis. Since when did McCain make sense? Was it before he lost his mind or after he lost his mind? McCain hasn't made sense for 30 years. What do you mean, McCain called them all one? McCain is a troublemaker, a warmonger. McCain tried to stir up hatred against Russia for the last 10 years now. No, McCain is no authority on who was at the alt-right rally and who was amongst the alt-left. Trump just said there were decent people in, in both camps. But he said that the responsibility falls on both sides. He was using the technique of compromise that I explained to you could have prevented the first civil war, compromise. But the press knows no compromise. The press wants outcome-based news. They want all of the people who wanted the Robert E. Lee statue to stay, including just Southerners who who like their heritage and their history. They want all of them painted as Nazis and KKK members. That is what the storyline is from the communist Bolshevik left. Do you understand that? And Trump would have nothing of it. Trump just showed great leadership, perhaps the greatest leadership of his presidency, by standing up to those who want a new civil war. You agree or disagree with that statement? I'll say it again if you missed it. Trump just showed great courage, great vision, an ability to compromise, a man who uh, could bring sides together by seeing things as they are, and I think it has just elevated him rather than reduced him even further. What happened here is that the media has come out to be worse than they are. He called them fake news. They're not fake news at all. They're much more dangerous than that. KLIF, Jeffrey, do you agree or disagree? Has Trump now impressed you or not? 
He has. I was uh, calling to say I'm proud to be a working Southern person again. I've always been a Trump supporter, but I was very concerned that uh, Trump was going to lose his base over this issue if he didn't get out and uh, support people equally. That, that's all we ask for, be treated equal. That's right. And he's, he actually watched the footage and studied it before drawing an opinion that was politically correct. He didn't put his finger in the air with some uh, saliva on it to see which way the wind was blowing, like Jerry Brown does, for example, or that all the other spineless politicians do, those that we've come to co- have nothing but contempt for. Trump is a man with a spine. He saw it like it was, and he said both sides have blame. Who could argue with that other than a biased propagandist? Thank you very much for calling. I'm so proud that I wrote Trump's War. And mark my words, in time, more and more Americans will come to respect this man for being strong and fair-minded. Trust me, by blaming all those on the right as racists, Nazis, Ku Klux Klan, you are simply making people even more radical. Be very careful what you're doing here. Up there in Albany, New York, we have WG, Day G, sorry, GDJ Radio in Albany. Dale is calling. Dale, you're on the Savage Nation. What's on your mind? Yeah, the 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 speech by the president, great. That that's what we're waiting to hear. The media, um, uh, what I'll call the Soros arc, they're trying to create a uh, high ground, a pretend high ground they hold, where basically everybody that's not Democrat, um, where they flood the lowlands. So the one place that's safe to retreat to is Soros Ark, and they do that by ni- manipulating the media from. Macho, Macho Maddow to Fingers Fallon. And Sorry, it's, ma- it's Macho Red Cow. It's Macho Red Cow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, 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 try, trying to push... Don't the- you love how they try to elevate the late-night comedians and nothing but stoner stand-up comedians with great agencies behind them uh, into being the, the new philosophers of our time? Since when did we ever pay attention to late-night hosts for philosophy, other than in this time when they were all licking Obama's boot for eight straight, boots for eight straight years? Why would I listen to this guy? Who is this guy, Fallon? He's a nobody. I- I'm sick of it. And Trump is finally standing up to these guys. So I'm really proud of him. I'm, I'm glad I supported him. He's really showing the courage that I always knew he had. And by the way, he's very smart. He saw right through the whole game. And he would not let them run him over. He made them define. He says, go ahead, define the alt-right. They couldn't do it, could they? They immediately try to change the argument. Nazi, 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 Ku Klux Klan, Ku Klux Klan. It's just like they're still on the college campuses. They're still on Adderall. They're still smoking marijuana at night. They're still going to orgies till 4 o'clock in the morning and then cleaning up for for breakfast. He saw right through them. I'm glad you saw this because it's it's a good day and a good example of what compromise can do. After all, he didn't bl- blame the, uh, the alt-left. He could have uh, gone to the left, couldn't he, and blame them. He could have said it was all their fault, but he didn't do that. He said there were good people on both sides, and there were bad people on both sides. But he said there's blame to go around. Now, what is wrong with that position? And I heard one of the reporters, one of the uh, New York types, who said, well, well, how could you equate them? Uh, uh, the alt-right, uh, they came out, uh, uh, they were all Nazis, weren't they? Didn't they all come out? Weren't they all Nazis? Didn't they provoke simply by being there? They shouldn't have even been there. There was no, there was no right for them to be there. That's the New York method. There's no right to be there if you don't agree with them. They forgot that they had a permit to march. Trump reminded them they had a permit to march. And by the way, Mr. New York reporter, the permit was achieved as a result of the ACLU, the Anti-Christian Liberty Union, going to a federal judge to get the alt-right, if you want to call them that, the right to assemble peacefully in that park. They came without weapons. The other side came with flamethrowers, sticks, stones, vomit, urine, bricks and bats. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. better than I felt in months uh, listening to Trump go after those idiots tooth and fang 
uh, blaming both sides, and especially the all left for the violence. It was beautiful. And to listen to the idiots uh, in the outcome-based news business go berserk confirms everything I've been saying. Of course there was violence on the left. Everybody saw that. And he was trying to say that there's a compromised position. But the, the girls and the boys in the media wouldn't have any of that. They wanted outcome-based news, which is that everyone who wanted to preserve the Robert E. Lee statue is a neo-Nazi, which is certainly false. And that everyone on the other side, even those with flamethrowers, rocks, urine, feces in a bag, sticks, they're all good guys. They were just defending themselves. Well, he wouldn't have any of it. Well, of course, those who went craziest were those at the Crescent News Network. Let's listen in now as we hear the stupidest people on the planet posing as journalists on CNN. We were all, I, I, we were all pretty stunned just watching that back and forth. Yeah, this is, this is a defining moment of the Trump presidency. I, I think that uh, is without a doubt. No matter what happens from here on out, this will be a defining Ooh. moment because Ooh. Donald Trump moment. left that elevator, walked behind that lectern with the presidential seal on it, and wow. equated Nazism with other things. He did uh, not, you filthy liar, you. He never said that. Not to once again... You are the Nazi, this. you left-wing liar, you. a president who has lost who touch with the Which American people this? in dramatic fashion. And this will be a defining moment of his presidency. <laughs> <laughs> this was a Gloria, in, in, as I said, a totally oh, yeah, more yeah. contrast Here's to Wolfie what we the heard blinker from now. the president Wolfie only the blinker. yesterday. Right. Only yesterday. It's clear that the president uh, was force-fed what he had to say uh, yesterday. And instead, what we heard on Saturday was the real Donald Trump. And he's been chafing about this. All right. And, all right. You heard that. You got the picture already. The psychopathic Bolsheviks at CNN can't get, can't get enough of hatred. That's what they peddle for a living, is hate. When you have, uh, oh, what's her name, Mad Cow? I, I forget the nickname I gave her. I'm so fond of her. Mad Cow, what's her name? Mad Girl? I don't. No, no, it's not Mad Cow. That's an old one. I came up with a new one. Macho Rad Cow. When you have uh, someone with such low intellect as Macho Rad Cow, someone as intellectually challenged as she is, doing better than Fox News, you know the country's in trouble. When you have a liar like Wolf Blitzer surviving this long, you know the country's in trouble. When you have an overt liar like Jim Acosta, who accosts everyone who comes near him if they don't agree with his left wing. A pro-immigration line, you know we're in trouble. I can go down the list. I'm on a roll. I'll stop, though. I feel good. I'd like to play that song, I Feel Good, Robert. Let me tell you something about radio. It's, the, it's a hard business that I'm in. Not only do you have to walk the line, but you have to tell the truth. And not only do you have to tell the truth, but you have to tell it in a way that keeps an audience listening. And I'm telling you, I feel good today. Now, it could be the spicy sausages that I had in the radio uh, studio during the break. I've reduced myself to eating as though I'm in a radio station in the 1990s where I don't even want a good lunch anymore. All I want is a reheated sausage on an old piece of bread in a microwave with some mustard on it. And must be good for me because I have more energy than I've had in a long time. Admittedly, they're chicken apple spicy sausages. They're the Cajun variety. They are so good. Mm, the mustard's even better. Now, my poor dog is another story. He's laying here listlessly under the desk listening to the Savage Nation, and he hasn't eaten all day. He has stopped quivering. I don't know what I'm going to do with him after the show. I'll try anything I can. I'll hold him in my arms and sing lullabies to him, but he's pretty sick and he's pretty old and I don't know what to do with him, but right now I'm feeling good. So let's go. Yeah, it's Jim Brown. That's right. That's right. You are the best. See, I got the A-team in radio. Everyone knows that. I run them so hard that when they're through, they don't need a workout. <laughs> they didn't laugh. I run them so hard they don't even laugh when it's a good joke. But you know what? The only reason they don't hate me even more than they do is because they know I work myself harder than I do them. Am I right, guys? In other words, if I were a lazy guy who was yelling and screaming to get this tape, get that tape, you know, they'd really hate me. But the thing is, they know how hard I work. I give this my heart and my soul. Let me tell you that right now. I feel good. How do you feel watching Trump stand up to these liars on the left? Do you feel good? you feel bad? you think he lied? you think he did the right thing? You know they're trying to crucify him because that's their whole stock and trade. When you have Macho Radcow, who is a talentless hack of the worst kind, She's a typical woman studies professor at uh, Duke University. Suddenly, she's a big star in the media for one reason, because she's been attacking Trump for nine straight months. Take any radical feminist from any university and give her a microphone, and there she is, uh, Rad Cow. That's what you got right there, is Rad Cow. And what is her stock and trade? Attacking Donald Trump. What's Donald Trump's biggest crime? Heterosexual, check that. White, check that. Male, check that. Married, check that. 
Father checked that. Grandfather checked that. Conservative checked that. Those are the six crimes against humanity. That's building MSNBC. And you know, Pill Griffin, who runs it, should know better. He's not a bad guy. I met him a few times, but he knows what he's doing. He's another one like Bernie Sanders, who's a smart guy and knows just what he's doing. He's throwing gasoline on the fires. And as far as I'm concerned, they are the reason, if there's another conflagration, that this conflagration occurred. I would blame the bosses of these hacks on television. I would blame the bosses of Showtime. I would blame the bosses of HBO. I would blame the CAA agency for putting these low-life louts in such high places as they throw lighter fluid on, on the flames. I told you at the beginning of the show, I spent two hours last night re-watching the PBS series on the Civil War, one of the greatest. I hadn't seen it in 20 years or more. I couldn't believe what I learned, how many things I learned watching, and I'm going to watch the rest of it tonight uh, on the big screen. And the fact of the matter is, uh, the historian of this series made a great point, which was about compromise. The historian Shelby Foote said that America is a nation of compromise, which is why we have two parties, which is how laws are written in this country through compromise. Don't you as a married person or don't, don't you who are even dating someone understand that it's all about compromise? I admit I'm a guy who's hard to get along with. I don't often compromise, but I found that I have to. Do you think that I got where I am as a best-selling author and as a broadcaster for all these years because I don't know the art of compromise? It's not so much the art of the deal as the art of compromise. What does that mean? It means seeing both sides, seeing the other side, and trying to move your position a little bit more in their direction, or else you're not in business. You don't last very long. Anyone could be a hard-headed idiot. But compromise could have stopped the first civil war. And right now, there's little, if any, compromise left in the political system. And that is what I've been talking about all day today, which is compromise. And Trump tried to say, as a good umpire, both sides are to blame. And for that, he was crucified by the illegitimate low IQ people in the media. Charles on KSFO, do you think Trump did the right thing? How do you feel today? I felt um, elation at being protected by my president. And the equivocation of evil on both sides, which I haven't seen during the Barack Obama administration. No, after five cops were shot dead by a Black Lives Matter supporter, Obama didn't condemn them. Instead, he said, you've got to see how they see the police. That's what Obama did. I didn't hear all of these, these crazy skirts go crazy then, did you? No. In fact, I felt like I was under siege ever since um, Holder made that uh, coward's comment, which I took personally, because I'm not, I don't consider myself a racist. I have a mixed race child. So this whole thing that because I'm white, I'm evil, I, I, I mean, I was getting tired of it. Well, that's why we elected Trump. We had enough of race baiting by Obama and Holder and Sharpton. Do you know how many times Al Sharpton was in and out of the White House? 50 times or more? You know that Al Sharpton personally picked Loretta Lynch to be attorney general? Do people know how far we went and how much we lost during that tyranny of eight straight years? I do. I studied it. Look, the, the journalists of today are intellectually dishonest, and they're not historians like they used to be. Used to have Charles. What Charles? What city do you live in? You live in. You're calling on KSFO online, I guess. Where are you calling from? What city? Uh, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Oh, Fort Lauderdale, old Fort Lauderdale. Old McDonald had a station. E I E I O. Charles, thank you for calling. The phone number is eight five five four hundred seven two eight two. So many people get this show on uh, the internet on a stream if they can't find it on a local radio station. They pick up their iPhone. I don't know what the app is. They just say, find Michael Savage radio show right now, and it goes right to the show. I have the largest audience in America, if not in the world, in talk radio on the stream. Do you know that? This show is heard mainly on the stream, or not mainly, in a big way on uh, the stream, which is the future, by the way. That's where people are going. So all I can say is this is a big time in American political history, and compromise, compromise, compromise. I think Trump was very impressive in his attempt at compromise, and I think that any fair-minded person who actually studied the footage will agree with him. It's that simple. And I think that he's going to have higher ratings as a result of this by putting the uh, left on defensive. Mike on KLIF in Dallas, Texas, thank you so much for listening down there in KLIF country. What's on your mind, Mike? Uh, I believe, and I am proud of 
President Trump. From the very beginning, he said the right things. The first words out of his mouth were, I condemn all extremists in this country. And that was the right thing to say, because that is the truth. They are, the Democrats are the ones that just have to hear alt-right Nazis and all that business. But Lewis Ferris— Isn't it, is it interesting, Mike, how we've gone from being deplorable to Nazis overnight? How did that happen? Man, it's ridiculous, and that's why I voted for Trump. I voted for Obama twice, and I got called a Nazi—I mean, a, a racist for eight years— and I voted for Trump, and I will never, ever vote for a Democrat again. And I bet millions of white Americans felt the same way, and that's why Hillary lost. It wasn't the Russians. It was Obama. Yeah, Obama was a race baiter for eight straight years, and the media was in compliance with him. And that is why we didn't hear him as he was. He was so skilled at lying. He was the smoothest tongue liar I've ever seen in my life. He could get away with calling you the worst racial epithets known to mankind, and you wouldn't even know he just insulted you. That's how good he was at it. And, of course, the media was in, in, hoots, in cahoots with him. Thank you for that call. Does anyone disagree with us? Does anyone think that the alt-right should be branded as Nazis? Does anyone think that all people who were de declared deplorables by Hillary Clinton are really secretly sheet-wearing Ku Klux Klan members? Let me tell you a little story about that before I take a quick break. When I first began in radio, it was on KS, actually it was on KGO Radio in San Francisco. I did a night, first I did fill-in, then I did a night show on KGO. There was a guy in the opposite uh, station to me while I was on. He was uh, in the glass booth opposite me. He's now in jail. He's been in jail for years for molesting children. Uh, I'm sorry to say it. I don't take pleasure in it, but he's been in jail for a good seven, eight years now. I guess he'll be out soon. Maybe they'll get another job somewhere. Uh, this man, every time I would come into the station, he was trying to harass me out of the business. He would say things like, I hear the white sheets rustling about me as I came in. I was so infuriated. I was so angered by it because I knew I was the last person on earth to be associated with uh, those people. But there was a really smart man who said to me, don't react to him. He wants you to react to him so you get fired and you lose your career in radio. But he said, you're much more talented than him. You're going to have a, a big career in radio. I could give credit where credit is due. It was Bill Wattenberg who told me not to react to that baiter across the glass. And because Bill told me not to react because I'm a hot-tempered person, I didn't react. And because I didn't react, I didn't lose my job in radio. And that's a lesson to all of you. Don't be baited by the illegitimate left. All of them, at the end of the day, are like that molester who went to prison. I'll be right back. Be here. I'll be nowhere. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. The Savage Nation is sponsored by Swiss America, the only company I trust with my financial future. Call 800-289-2646 or SwissAmerica.com. alt-left and white supremacists on the same moral plane. I'm not putting anybody on a moral plane. What I'm saying is this. You had a group on one side and you had a group on the other and they came at each other with clubs and it was vicious and it was horrible and it was a horrible thing to watch. But there is another side. There was a group on this side, you can call them the left, you've just called them the left, that came violently attacking the other group. So you can say what you want, but that's the way it is. <laughs> So you said there was hatred, there was violence on both sides. Are, are well, I do right think there's blame. Yes, I think there's blame on both sides. So you look at you sides? look at both sides. I think there's blame on both sides, and I have no doubt about it. And you don't have any doubt about it either. But and, oh, only and, 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 and and if you reported it accurately, you would say. I had enough of listening to these low life, failed intellectuals called journalists. What journalists? What journalists? They can't get a job teaching, so they give him a microphone and a, and a camera job. Forget about it. I'm proud that he's the president. He's the only one who has the guts to stand up to these jackals. And frankly, his standing is going to go up, up, up. Those who hate him will always hate him. And those who voted for him were wavering. They're not going to be wavering after this. Let me tell you right now, 
Why? Because he saw it like it was and he called it like it is. Anyone who actually took the time to study the footage of Charlottesville will understand what actually happened. So let me repeat it for you. As repugnant as some on the right are, the KKK, the Nazis, we all know that. I don't know who supports them, but some do. There were others amongst them who were simply there because they did not want to see a piece of their heritage destroyed. That is the, the statue of Robert E. Lee. Somehow they all got lumped in as Ku Klux Klan and Nazis. That's what the press specializes in, which is smearing anyone who doesn't agree with their Bolshevik agenda. Okay? On the other side were the good, loving, peace-loving, peaceful, leftist protesters who were wearing helmets. Uh, one of them had a flamethrower. It's a very famous picture from Getty Images. Flamethrower, shooting it at the other guys. Rocks, stones, feces, urine, bricks, rocks, sticks, hitting, hitting people, and there was an altercation. So there's plenty of blame to go around. And the president said there was violence on both sides and there's blame to go around. But that wasn't good enough for the propagandists. They went berserk. I think the president showed himself to be a good leader in a very, very inflammatory time. He tried to be a, comp a man of compromise, and they wouldn't have it. So now you have it. Now you see it for what it is. I told you I watched the Civil War series last night for two straight hours. I intend to watch the rest of it tonight from 1990. And I told you that the historian said that we were a nation of compromise before the Civil War, and somehow because we lost the ability to compromise, the Civil War grew and grew and grew, and it got worse. The president just tried to find common ground. He tried to find compromise. And who was it who would not compromise? Your friends in the media. Your friends in the propaganda arm of the international Bolshevik party that is trying to take over the entire world. Savage.